two common challenges facing manufacturers are short time frames and producing good products. On the short time frames, there's product schedules, there's time to market to beat out competitors, there's making deadlines, there's getting things done in time, and all those require a product to be designed, analyzed, built, and gotten out the door as fast as possible. Similarly, sort of a fighting against the short time frame is a desire to produce the best product at the best quality at the best price. And they're sort of competing, but with some uh, analysis work early on in the design, we can do an awfully good job at helping out both of these common challenges. Digital simulation has, has many benefits in the area, such as validating products, predicting product uh, performance, optimizing designs, and all these things can be done most effectively early on in the design, and I'll talk about that. A lot of design environments are set up so that you go through the design, people come up with sketches, they make pictures, they come out with a the design, they test it, they built prototypes maybe, and at the very, very end here, this little yellow box, someone says, hey, we ought to do some simulation. And so it ends up being validation focused. It's looking, saying, did this design that we did work, all this work on up till now, was it any good? And the other thing people do is sort of reactive use, where something has gotten down to the testing or the prototype stage, and it doesn't work. So now there's a rush to do some kind of simulation to find out why it doesn't work. And this is very common. Many companies and organizations uh, do analysis in that method. Another thing is companies that actually do analysis often have an analyst analysis group or they're outsourcing it, and they only have limited access to the people who are doing the design. They may have access to an engineer, they may have access to a manager, but they don't have much access to the people who are actually doing the design, uh, partly because they may not be physically located similarly, or it may just be that they don't have the same kind of software. So these are both common environments, but they obviously don't lend themselves well to getting things out the door fast and getting really good products made all the time. But everybody can benefit from simulation. The validation people who are already likely doing it, the analysts over here on the right side, are doing a lot of simulation already. They're validating existing designs. They're validating potential concepts designs. But it's even better if you can move it back a little bit. The engineers who are designing parts can do optimization if they're doing simulation. They can uh, take and look at various options. They can analyze things fairly early on in the cycle and come up with a better design. Similarly, designers all the way off here on the left, fairly early in the design cycle, have options to choose different things, different parts, different materials fairly early on in the cycle if they have a valid reason to do so. And this all goes to the fact that if you look at the red curve here, the cost of design changes is relatively uh, cheap back when you're conceptualizing, when you're in preliminary design, when you're thinking of things. Once you start doing more engineering, it gets more expensive to change your design. By the time you're testing, you're sort of wedded to a design, and you're not going to let go of that design unless you have some very compelling reason because the cost goes up. And of course, once you're manufacturing it and it's out in the field, the cost of changing that design becomes warranty issues, it becomes failures in the field, and it's very, very expensive to change the design at that point. On the other hand, early in the design, the ability to affect the functional capabilities, to affect that final design, is very, very high. And conceptualization, when it's just in your head, you can change the design anywhere you want. You can come up with anything you want. But as time goes on and engineering is done and more testing is done, as I'd mentioned, people become sort of stuck on a design and the ability to affect the functional capabilities drops off drastically to the point where you're in the manufacturing in the field. You really can't change your design. There's no ability to do it unless you do a wholesale recall or a wholesale upgrade or design change. So the point of this graph is that way back early on, 
is the point where you can have the most proactive impact on your design. Why are people doing simulation? There's a little survey that people did, and people are doing simulation largely to meet product requirements. 76% of the people said they had requirements for a certain weight, for speeds, for certain behaviors it had to meet, and that's great. A lot of people said downstream development costs can be avoided by doing simulation. In some ways, that's an even better reason to do simulation because you're back on the left-hand side of the graph where your ability to affect things is both cheaper and greater. Customers also have safety uh, contractual obligations and regulatory requirements. There's a lot of requirements that go in. A lot of these can be met or at least analyzed to determine if my design will meet it all the way back in preliminary design if we do some kind of simulation. Similarly, lower production costs are always good. Can I make it thinner? Can I make it lighter? How can I make it better? And again, half the, half, roughly halfly, 47% of people are doing that. And of course, if I'm making a better design, my warranty costs will be lower, my servicing costs will be lower, I'll have a higher quality product, I may sell more, I'll have a better perception of my product. So these are all really good reasons to do detailed design simulation and to do it early when you have a greater ability to affect your product and the cost of changing things are a lot cheaper. So in order to do this early on, what do you need? Probably the most important thing you need is some type of CAD embedded simulation. A CAD embedded simulation tool allows a designer at the very, very earliest stages of a design to quickly run through simple simulations and say, is this acceptable? Is this going to meet my requirement? How much does it weigh? Is it going to vibrate improperly? And you can do that really early on with CAD embedded simulation tools. Now, of course, they have to be easy to use. Otherwise, they either won't be used or you'll end up with specialists using them and you end up with sort of a silo effect where the designers and the analysts aren't talking with each other. If you're going to do this simulation early on, it's important that you have software that people trust, that's accurate, that you know what it's going to do. And requirements come in a wide range of analysis types. There's vibration requirements, there's shock requirements, there's temperature requirements. And so in order to meet those requirements, you, your CAD embedded simulation has to have a wide range of analysis types available to it to assure that you can meet these and assure you can test things. Again, if you spend hours and days and months working on it, your time to market is negatively affected rather than positively effective. And similarly, if the product crashes all the time because it's not very robust, that doesn't help you either. So speed, robustness are very uh, definitely needed things in order to make CAD-driven simulation effective. And of course, it's always nice to have a general FEA knowledge. We try to make things as sort of black box-like as possible so that you don't need to know awesome finite element theory, but it's nice to know some basic facts in order to get that. But having all these, there's lots of things we can do. So where do people use simulation effectively? A lot of times people are using it, sometimes too late, but they're using it to refine and select design ideas. I'll go through a little example where we had a couple design ideas and we wanted to see if the light one actually worked or whether we had to go with the heavy one. Similarly, sizing components. A lot of people are using it to size components. Do I need the bigger part or will the smaller one work? And a substantial number of people are using off-the-shelf components. And you can do a simulation, and the simulation may tell you which off-the-shelf component do I need. If I have a force of 10,000 newtons, I need to have a component off the shelf that's rated at, at least 10,000 newtons. So these are all really good reasons that simulation design. What you want to do is really early in the design to be able to ask questions like this. Can I make this part 10 meter, millimeters thick instead of 15 millimeters? If I increase the fillet radius, will it double the lifespan of my part? I don't know. It's a fatigue problem. How about aluminum? I'm designing something. Weight is an issue. Can I use aluminum instead of steel? 
if we're doing this really early on before we're committed to a design, we can ask questions like this. Can I save money with it? And so on. So Autodesk has a whole collection of simulation products in our portfolio. Starting on the right, we have composite material simulation that let you do simulations of laminated composites and solid composites to determine whether they're going to fail, whether they're going to work, and whether my design is acceptable. We have molding processes that simulate the manufacturing of plastic uh, parts and technology. We have architectural simulation, our robot program to analyze buildings and whether buildings meet code and whether they're strong enough. We have computational fluid dynamics, our uh, simulation flow that allows you to examine flow through pipes, heat exchangers, pipes, and flow around buildings and flow air cooling and things like that. What I'm going to talk about mostly today, though, is over on the far left here, our structural mechanics simulations, our Autodesk Nastran NCAD product, and a little bit about Nastran and simulation mechanical. Autodesk Nastran NCAD, as mentioned, is a mechanical simulation tool. It's embedded inside of Autodesk Inventor or SolidWorks. It has all those benefits that I had mentioned of being a CAD embedded product. It's easy to use. It's right up front where the designers can get to it. It does a wide range of different analyses to meet different requirements and look at different things. And it's powered by the accurate and trusted Autodesk Nastran solver. Many, many people are familiar with Nastran. It's, it's somewhat of a standard around the world. So when you're using Nastran, you have some confidence you're getting your answers correctly. So I'm going to go on and do a little demo here. And I'm going to go into the same pedal box here that uh, Jeff had done in his previous one. So let's bring up my inventor product here. And here's this same pedal box. I had gotten rid of most of the bolts and nuts and screws and rivets in it because from an analysis point of view, I'm looking at components, not that. In particular, there's a little component here on the left that's a, a foot rest or a clutch rest where your foot sets. And a couple competing designs for this little bracket were come up with. And we want to look at those designs because one of them is quite a bit lighter than the other and see whether that works. So let's limit our uh, model down here to just this little clutch rest and we'll uh, move it over into our screen. See how we do a, uh, an Autodesk Nastran analysis on it. We'll start by going up to our environment up here and getting into Autodesk Nastran NCAD. So here's Autodesk Nastran NCAD and our little interface. This, uh, this uh, clutch plate was designed in Inventor and the materials were assigned to it. So I'm, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to import my materials from Inventor. And then I'm going to create some others. I'm going to create a material here for some bolts. And the bolts in this model that I'm holding it together with are made with alloy steel. So I'm going to set alloy steel, say close down here, say OK. And my materials are not behaving. Just a minute. Let me open this back up. Okay. There we go. Okay. That time it worked. I imported my materials from my prop. So the aluminum 6061 came over and it came over with a modulus of elasticity, a density, and all the things I knew along with allowables over here. So a second material came over that was a generic material. I'm going to change this generic material to be this alloy steel that I had created on the other one. So I'm going to say close on that. I'm going to get rid of that and say OK. So I have two materials now, an aluminum alloy and a steel alloy for the bolts. So I'm going to start and I'm going to assign properties to this material. I'm going to mesh this with solid elements so I don't really need to know the thickness. So I'm going to start off by creating a physical property. It's going to be aluminum and I'm going to make this bracket one piece of aluminum. And then I'm going to make this little footrest up here 
also aluminum. So here's my aluminum for the footrest. So I've got two physical properties, both of them made out of aluminum. Now, before I can run the model, I have to hold it somewhere. Well, this little footrest is held down around these little holes down here in the base down here. So I'm going to create a constraint over here, and I'm going to constrain the little ring here, the little ring here, the little ring here, and the little ring here. So these won't move. So this is my fixed base. So when I push on this and try to load my little, uh, little clutch plate here, it's not going to move. Now I'm going to create a load on my model. And the load is on this surface up here. So I'm going to pick this little surface up here. It's going to be a force. And the force is actually directed along the clutch plate because when someone puts their foot on here, there's a little pedal bolted onto here. It generates a load that runs down the length of this. So I'm going to put my direction as following a geometric entity, and I'm going to follow this little line here. It's got a magnitude of 600 newtons that represents basically the uh, weight that's being put on uh, the, uh, the clutch plate, so 600 newtons. So I have a load on here. I've got that. Now I have properties, I've got a properties assigned, but I'm still missing a couple things. One thing I'm missing is that the base piece down here and the rod, that I, the plate that I'm working on, are two separate pieces. And they're not held together in the model because I don't have the bolts in here. So I'm going to create an analytical tool here inside of Nashtran called a connector. And my connector here, I'm going to use a bolt connector. And a bolt connector lets me put in the size of the bolt, which is 6.5975 millimeters. And it lets me choose that the head of the bolt is down here, and the other end of the bolt is down here. And it draws a little icon that represents a bolt. I'm going to make a copy of that. And then I'm going to put another bolt here from this ring to this ring. I'll make a copy of that one. And then I'll do one from this ring here out to this ring here. So there's three bolts, six and a half millimeter bolts, and I'm not going to worry about all the other things on it because that's what they are. Nastrin is actually putting in a little connection that holds these together when I do this. So now I've got a load, I've got constraints, it's all held together. Oh, there's one more thing. This is a sheet metal part that's all been welded, that's been folded up into shape, and then the side over here has been welded together with a little weld that runs down it. So we're going to weld this together using a contact within uh, Autodesk Nastran. I'm going to do it manually, and I'm going to connect from these surfaces here are going to be my master surface, and I'm going to connect them to the corresponding surfaces over here, here, and here. And I don't want separation contact. What I want is an offset bond. And this bond is about 5 millimeters wide. There's a gap of about 5 millimeters. So I'm going to put in 5 millimeters. So any areas of these within 5 millimeters of each other will be welded together. So there I have a weld. So the last thing I need to do is mesh my model. And I'm going to mesh my model using parabolic tetrahedrons. I'm going to use a size of about 5 because I have found that works pretty good. And I'm not going to use continuous meshing. And I'll just run this little model here. And it goes through and it generates a mesh. So here's a mesh. I can look at my mesh on my model and see that in these fillets, Autodesk Nashtran puts a slightly finer mesh because you need more elements to resolve stress gradients in that area. So I have everything I needed. I've set this up to be a linear static analysis. So we're just going to run my little linear static analysis. It's going to whip through and tell me various things while it runs. It's going to tell me there's a couple elements that have potential problems, but I've looked at them before and I know they're not a problem. And it comes out and finishes the analysis. It automatically loads the results in, and I can go into my results form here and plot some results. Let's look at the solid von Mises stresses that I'm getting here and see what I get. If I display this, I have some uh, fairly high stresses here. And they're potentially a problem. They're around the bolts, however. So 
it tells me I need to think about bolts maybe. I need to think about bolts a little more. So I'm going to look at that, but I'm going to consider these tentatively acceptable for right now because they're in an area that I'm not too sure about. But I'm going to look at this and say, I'm looking at my model, realizing that I am pushing on it here, and it's going down a fairly long, slender member. And if I push on a long, slender member, there's always the chance that I could have a buckling problem. So let's take a look and see if I've got a buckling problem. So I'm going to go back to my model over here. And I am going to make a copy of my analysis here. I have my linear static analysis. I'm going to copy it. And that will retain all my uh, loads and boundary conditions. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change it from a linear static analysis to a linear buckling analysis. Really, that's about all I have to do at this point, except that I now have to put my loads and constraints in the buckling subcase. So I've got my connectors, I've got my loads, I've got my forces, I've got my aluminum. Hey, I just realized something. My connectors are aluminum. That's why the stresses were high. My connectors should be made out of alloy steel. Okay. Okay, and alloy steel. Okay. Let's look at a buckling analysis with this design now. Like I said, I've put it all together. I'm going to run it again. It's going to generate my NASTRAN file, and it's going to tell me if pushing down on this is going to cause a collapse failure before I end up with high stresses that are causing other problems. When I run a buckling analysis, this is a linear buckling analysis, a linear buckling analysis, I wish I could say it were worst case, but in some ways it's sort of a best case. It tells you the maximum load that something could uh, withstand before it collapses. And it does that by solving and giving you an eigenvector. If I look up here in my subcases, I have an eigenvector up here of 1.14. And that means that whatever I load I applied on here, and I applied a load of 600 newtons, if I multiply my load of 600 newtons by 1.14, that tells me that this is going to buckle at a little over 600 newtons. I find that a little too close for comfort for me. So I'm going to do something different. I'm going to find out, because that's a, word, that's a best case, the worst case could actually be lower than that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this to a nonlinear buckling analysis. So I'm going to copy this analysis again, and I paste it in, and I'm going to call this one, I'm going to edit it now, and I'm going to turn it into a nonlinear buckling analysis. A nonlinear buckling analysis takes into account such things as large deformations and material plasticity and contact and impact. So I can look at this and run this job and see what I get. When I do a nonlinear analysis, I often like to do things like turning on intermediate output. When I turn on intermediate output, what happens is it breaks my load up into a series of increments. In this case, we'll do it into 20 increments because it gives us a nice smooth graph. And we'll break it up into 20 increments, and we're going to run this analysis. Now, this is a nonlinear analysis, and it takes a lot longer to run. So I'm not going to actually run it here and make everybody sit and listen while I babble away while it runs. Um, suffice it to say that I already ran this analysis. So I'm going to switch over to another database here where I've actually run this nonlinear buckling analysis. When I run this nonlinear buckling analysis, let me bring in some results. I've got results down here called nonlinear buckling that I ran earlier. And my nonlinear buckling analysis sort of like the other one, gives me a series of results. A ser it gives me an eigenvalue on here in the bottom of 2.2, but it also gives me an incremented load that shows the nonlinear static analysis as it moves. I can plot uh, XY plot of this displacement versus load, and what I see 
when I pull up this plot is that at a tenth of my load, it starts to go, and somewhere around 60 to 70 percent of the load, I have a substantial loss of stiffness. Um, it's not really a buckling situation because a buckling situation would be a vertical line, but it is a substantial loss of stiffness. If I go in and plot some results on this, I can go to my options and I can look at the last increment here and plot a deformation. I can see it at the very end of the nonlinear static analysis. The load on this has bent this up here fairly substantially. And I look at this and say, yeah, that's a problem. It's potentially a problem. And in fact, what's happened is the buckling load on this actually increased because when I pushed it down like this, it changed the dynamics of the system enough and the physics that it's no longer going to buckle at the load I had originally estimated. So this justifies my nonlinear buckling analysis, but it's identified something that isn't nonlinear buckling. It's identified the fact that when I put a load on this of a fairly moderate load, it's going to bend off. Obviously, we don't want this part to bend off when we run it into the car. So I'm going to uh, make some changes to this model. I'd mentioned there was another part that had been, uh, been uh, developed for this. So I'm going to um, go back to my 3D model here and get out of Nastran and locate this part, which is this one. And it is down here somewhere. Oops. And I'm going to do just what Jeff had done earlier here. I'm going to go to my component, and I'm going to replace this component with a part that's sitting elsewhere up here. It's sitting in here, and it's called 1159 right here. And there's a part. So I'm going to say yes, and it's brought in the part. And you can see mostly it's the same part on here. But this part now has been bent into a shape that's slightly different, and it's welded over here. So I'm going to run the same model again. I'll have to redo my bolts, and I'll update my meshes. And when I go back into my uh, Nashtran environment here, you can see it's giving me a little explanation, exclamation point over here that says that it can't find some of the stuff because I switched out the part. So I'd have to go in, and I'll put new loads on it and replace those. And my bolts appear to have come across beautifully. I like that. My constraints are still there. And it's telling me my mesh up here needs to be updated as well. So normally at this point what I do, I'll do this, I'll update it, I'll run it. It's again, it's a nonlinear analysis. It takes, I think it took about 15 minutes to run this time. So I'm going to pretend I ran this. And I'm going to jump over to my uh, final database here. And this is the model that it looks like with the loads and all on it. And I'm going to load in my results that I ran, which is new model, nonlinear buckling. And when I load this in and look at this, I can go to my XY plot and look at my displacement versus load factor. Now what you notice, instead of having a substantial loss in strength here at 60-70% of the load, it's just a gradual increase as it goes up. So it's not, not a, a big problem. The other thing to note is that my buckling load is pretty high. It's six now. And I'd actually put in an oversized load on here. I think I put in 800 newtons, 1.6. So my actual buckling load is more than twice my design load. And I've eliminated this bending problem that I had in the other by swapping out a part. So this is sort of a quick illustration of what we can do with uh, Autodesk Nashtran in CAD. Let me go back here to my presentation and wrap up with a little summary here. So how is this helping us? Well, in this one, it's predicting my product performance. It's telling me that in, a, in an accident where the driver's weight loaded this, it was likely to bend and that we actually needed to go back to the heavier part that wasn't going to bend. It also is validating lifetime performance. I can use simulation once I've gotten my design set and do a fatigue analysis, give me an estimate of how long my part is going to last. And it eliminates unnecessary cost from the design. In this case, we were hoping that the lighter part would work, but it turns out that was a necessary cost, not an unnecessary cost. 
I could then take this and evaluate even more opera, uh, uh, even more design options. A designer working with that part could modify the part, put lightning holes in it possibly, and evaluate all sorts of options early on. And once he'd done a number of simulations, he could come back and say, okay, here's a design, I know it's good, and it's going to be good for everything. So with that, Autodesk has solutions for analysts, engineers, and designers. We have a wide portfolio of simulation tools, many of which interoperate with each other. We have flexible cloud solving. You can put your analysis out on the cloud, run it there, and you're assured of always having the latest version of the software and always having enough memory and disk space in order to run your job. All our simulation tools have comprehensive analysis capabilities that extend from buckling and nonlinear analysis to all sorts of other analysis, modal analysis, uh, impact, drop testing, and so on. And InCAD is connected and embedded within our CAD system. So it's available from designer all the way up to analysis, analyst. It's industry trusted and accurate. So with that, I will go to questions and answers and see what we got. Great, thanks, Bart. We now welcome everyone to go ahead and submit their questions via chat so they can be addressed. Okay, Bart, this is uh, Steve <clears throat> moderating. We have a few questions that have come in. The first okay. one being, what makes an analysis non, uh, what makes an analysis nonlinear and how would I know? Well, <laughs> I always hate that question because there's a whole lot of things that definitely make an analysis nonlinear. One of them is the presence of materials that yield, so or or materials that are nonlinear. For instance, elastomers and various types of rubber. You push on them and they get a lot stiffer the harder you push on them, and that's a nonlinear material effect. So if you've got that in your system, you know you've got a nonlinear analysis. Similarly, if you've got parts that hit each other or assemblies with pins that fit in holes that bump up against each other, that's clearly a nonlinear problem, and you know you've got a nonlinear problem. Lastly, you have issues with large displacements. And that's sort of a subjective one. And the large displacement we had in this particular model that we looked at, once the, uh, the, the pedal area there, the footrest, started to bend off, the load was changing direction and changing the characteristics of the system. And we weren't sure we had that, but we identified that one by running a nonlinear analysis. So you can tell you have a nonlinear problem Obviously, if you've got some of these types of nonlinearity that you know of, but sometimes it's not obvious, and the only way to tell is to actually run a linear analysis, run a nonlinear analysis, and compare the answers. If they're the same, it's linear. So that's <laughs> that's sort of the best I can do with that. Okay. And uh, what other types of analysis can someone run with NAS training CAD? Okay, lots. There's all sorts of things. We ran a static analysis, and then we ran a linear buckling analysis, and then we ran a nonlinear buckling analysis. Part of the nonlinear buckling analysis was actually a nonlinear static analysis, and that, would, that handled the large displacement effects, it handles material plasticity, and it handles contact and impact and parts hitting each other. Um, with the nonlinear, we can also do dynamics problems within CAD. A lot of times there's a frequency specification that your, your system has to be able to survive being shaken at a certain frequency, or it has to be survive being dropped from a certain height. And these are all dynamic analysis. Some are nonlinear, some are linear. And those are also available in Nastra and NCAD. Um, also, if you have temperature problems where you have hot things and cold things, and heat flows and radiation and convection, uh, Autodesk Nastran has a fairly comprehensive thermal solver built into it that allows you to do thermal problems. In addition, you can take the temperature distributions from the thermal problems and use them as loads for a structural problem so that you can solve a thermal problem to get the temperature distribution and then you can figure out how it affects a structural problem. So those are some other things you can do. 
dynamics, assemblies, nonlinear, <laughs> thermal. Okay, somebody also asked a question, can Autodesk robots structural work alongside with NASTRANS? At the moment, no. At the moment, there's only a limited connectivity between robot and uh, NASTRAN. Um, I, I hope this is in the uh, plan for the future, but I really don't know and I can't say whether it is or not. Okay. And uh, another question would be, how do nonlinear and linear buckling differ? Oh, okay, cool. Um, linear buckling assumes your model basically stays where it was when you built it. And so if you have straight columns, linear buckling assumes the loads and it uses sort of an Euler buckling formula to come up with a buckling load. However, if you've ever run into problems where you have eccentricities, for instance, I have a column that's being compressed, but someone is also pushing on the side of it such that it's bending slightly, Obviously, that reduces the buckling load significantly. And when you have a situation like that, you have a nonlinear buckling problem. Similarly, you may have contact that comes into contact and comes out of contact. Or um, uh, an example that I've used, if I have a, a tower and it's held up by cables and I push down on the tower or push sideways on the tower, two of the cables are going to go slack and the other two cables will stay in tension. That also is a nonlinear buckling problem. So the difference is, is the presence of a, a nonlinear preload that can change the geometry and the stiffness of the structure. It's a little bit harder to solve and you sort of have to work up onto the answer, but that's basically the difference. <laughs> 